Um, so, what is the future of K band science with the GBT? And what did you say, Tony? So, what is what are the primary what is the primary science extragalactic science is being done in K band? Is it just the mega major projects? I mean, pretty much. We haven't done high redshift CO of K band in a long time. I think Dominic is working on the thing. Uh, there, we did a little and did a, a couple of virtual galaxies, but we is haven't that, done a lot of high redshift CO of K band. Is that because the proposals aren't making it through or because they aren't being proposed? They're, they, they're, they're not, not being really proposed. being They're not being proposed. proposed. Right. Not, not right now, no. Because you get it's hard to do, it's challenging to do to get the baseline stability and and, and get down. And they moved a lot to using the BLA. Well, it kind of progressed then to using the KA here, uh -huh. and then it jumped to the BLA after the upgrade or ALMA. And also, with that redshift that you would use it for K band. There's an advantage in going at three millimeters because you get multiple lines of higher redshift of four to five. That's sort of the redshift four range, four to five range. You, you can smash multiple lines into a single ALMA observation? We can, they, 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 they two sort of, seconds. Okay. They get two lines, basically. Sure. The nice thing about one to zero, though, is it's always CO. Yeah. <laughs> and people argue, well, maybe it's HCN or HCO plus every single line that we've ever detected and it's been followed up. That's always been CO1 or CO1. Sure. You have yet to get a detection of a line with the GBT and AAA or whatever. It yeah. wasn't. It's still triple that, but it's like one a year. Oh. What, I'm sorry, Tony? We still get high redshift CO observations. Okay. Proposed about once a year. This is true. We have a. So there are a number of things that can be done with the Maser stuff. Um, the first thing is um, to improve the Hubble constant. Um, it's a lot of work to get to improve on four percent. You know, we would have to, to double the project to get down to two and a half percent. That's a lot of work and probably um, not something that we're going to do right now. But the things we could do is we could reobserve a couple of the galaxies that were poorly observed. Um, in order to get distance measurements, because that's relatively cheap with something like 60 to 80 hours of total GBT time between monitoring and VLBI. We could get uh, two or three distances, so that's valuable. Um, another thing that, that the project has questioned is if we were to take a look at our very best maser systems and come back and observe them five years later, when all the masers that we have observed have now gone out, someone, I forget who asked, someone asked about shifting all, all the masers being gone. Now we're looking at a whole new set of masers. Um, that's an independent observation that we could certainly uh, use to improve the distance to our best galaxies, which could make a meaningful distance. Now, there are systematic uncertainties that that can't address, like the peculiar velocity is a limiting factor in, in some of our um, is some of our maser systems. So that would be a, another way to improve the number cheaply without investing hundreds and hundreds of dollars. The third thing that people are interested in is finding masers in systems that are unlike the ones that, that I described, but that fall on different parts of the black hole spectrum so that we can get precise masses of black holes of either brightest cluster galaxies or dwarf galaxies. That would require you know, observations of uh, surveys of order 100 ish hours followed by the LDI, which would be not too expensive. Has there been anything done as far as whether the accretion disk could be patchy? Say, you know, make it extreme that, you know, a third of the orbit, you get the masers, the other two thirds you don't. So, going back and redid the survey, you might find a few sources that have now come back around to having masers. Yeah, uh, that yeah. So that's a good question. That's something that we that I tried in the early days, uh, but we haven't tried it again for fifteen years. But worth a try. Just going back and re-examining some of the the galaxies that we don't understand uh, whether or not they're coming from a maser disk or not. So one of the things that I think to answer your question is also. How, what fraction of the time 
or you and VOB conversation at K band that aren't the mega measure major, right? So, um, how many, you know, Tony, you, you probably have that sort of guess for, for that. Yeah, when Mega Maser project was going on, the LBI was something like 10% of the time on GPT. It's fallen probably uh, 2 3%. Yeah. Probably with radio astronaut gone, that's yeah. to coin Yeah, there's a kick up with radio astronauts. How much K band is done for VLBI? And then in com comparison to other, I know the three millimeter. It varies a lot. Okay. They come in here and there. I wouldn't say it's any more or less than you know, any other frequency. But it's one of the more common frequencies, right? So that. So is extragalactic science largely dead at KBAN? It's not dead. It's, I just don't think it would be, I would argue, for building a new instrument, it probably. Extra galactic science would be a huge science driver, but following up Jim's um, point, you want to have two pixels obviously with very good sensitivity, not only for extra galactic, but also the chemistry people will probably, they weren't mapping with like the bandwidth and very good sensitivity. I don't even need two pixels. Take one. One. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You kind of need an off most of the time. That's what position switching is for. You know how the no, uh, well two inch is not if your source is small enough. If the source is small enough, yes. I'm biased. We don't look at those small sources. <laughs> I guess I, I got another way of asking a question is from the original science proposal for the GBT, how many of those science cases that were written for extragalactic science actually are being done, actively done on the GBT? I have to go back and look. I know. Yeah way back in the 90s when we were talking about it i mean a lot of it was some of the high you know, right. stuff, and we but we, we did do some of that it's really challenging with single wish in terms of baseline baseline stability baseline stability yeah so much easier with an interferometer where you don't have the your baseline structures don't correlate okay. so i mean even with the the idea, of course, is that you don't have an you have an off-axis feed, so you would do baselines would have been cleaner, but mm -hmm. you have all the other stuff and the cables and the equipment and everything else. It's when you push down the systematics. So did, did anyone do any extragalactic chemistry survey? I didn't see a whole lot. I mean, I was going to poke at that. Like have people approached you about that? No, uh, for example. Like you know, Jeff. That would be an absolutely great target. Which one? Uh, G53. Yeah, two, five, three. That was part of the mango survey for ammonia. So you do see it in ammonia. It's, I see. It's a yeah. I, I mean, 253 has sort of a large project on Loma now. Yeah, it, and has had several smaller projects. It is flying dense up in the middle here. So it should be interesting things to see that. Down in K band. Anybody want to give me 300 hours? Going once? Jim? <laughs> you can do it for sure. Well, it's like, I, you've you heard it. That's, 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 that's a yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, you want to, you know, what is the possibility of doing like some demonstration science? But he seems to get it out there. Like, like look at NGC 253, KK, and Q band. Say, do a you know, big spike engine put out to Q and say, hey, we're still here. No, that's, that's, a, that's a possibility. The thing with, with that sort of project is you run out of sources really quickly. You know, if you're going to do what M82, maybe, maybe I see, you know, there's like half a dozen galaxies that you have a chance. It's diminishing returns. It's a big project. Mm -hmm. These lines are kind of tough. I don't know how, you know how much integration time went into the ammonia detections of these other galaxies. Uh, th it was multiple hours. Um, I, I think. I can't remember what it was exactly. I know the CO observations were 20 hours. I can't remember what the ammonia observations were. Um, yes, it could be done. I think it would be a nice demonstration project. I don't know if there's there's a uh, big crowd that would want to follow along with doable projects that are going to get through the time. The time request. How many 
too is interesting. I, I, I mean, to me, it seemed like that should have been a much easier detection than it was, and it's not detected at the core, and it is detected offset. And that's odd. Yeah. I think um, the lines are just too broad. Yeah. Maybe they didn't recognize those lines. But the line widths in the center of MHU are quite large. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So Sophia has a hard time fitting the C plus line into its band. Wow, that could be. So bringing back somewhat to the topic of yesterday's discussion, should we be doing more ammonia mapping? Should we do a galactic plane survey or more sensitive surveys? And importantly, should these be PI led or should the observatory take these on as, you know, especially if we build a new instrument, you know, should we take on that responsibility of running those surveys as a service? I like it being led outside, just in terms of building relationships with the science community instead of doing an internal project because you would like to have buy-in from our from the community and excitement within the community where we would support them the best we can with, you know, for example, operator run and, and pipelines and, and that, but have it driven by our community. So the all the driven. Observatory-wide surveys have been an absolute failure, an abject failure. In what yes. way? In terms that they made the products, but the people didn't. So, no one's using. I mean, I mean, I'm forcing my grad student to look at the. That's one of the, you know, uh, uh, protoplanet uh, evolved star surveys that they did. Um, but it, it just, it just, no one's using it. So. Is this a punishment. Or? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why. But it's. I mean, I know that the HST observatories like, like DDTs and stuff were pretty successful. What about Spitzer? Was there any kind of observatory wide? Spitzer? Well, they did the instrument team projects, and then I think the analogy is VLAS, right? Maybe that's yeah. That's what, yeah. Yeah. VLAS or first or NBSS. Those those are. So, but yeah, they, would and, that have the kind of community buy-in? Yes, that's that's what you want. You don't like the so observatory projects were internally proposed for and awarded, and then we told the community. So those were not the best way to do it. Whereas like VLAS, if you want to do an all sky ammonia survey, you get you know 50 people involved from the community to write up a white paper and all that kind of say this is really what we want to do and then support behind it and generate the products and provide, yeah. That's that's the way you want to go about doing it. So in some way, it's a observatory-wide effort, but it's it's led by the science community. Well, the JWOC ERS programs are might even be a happy medium there, right? Because those are PI-led, but they're funded by NASA, right? So they provided funds to hire postdocs to produce the data, work on the the processing. And then all the data are immediately available to the public. Those have been wildly successful. What is this funding of which you speak? Well, I, I understand. This is why I am not an observatory management. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's, the, that's the issue here. We're, we're, you know, the NSF doesn't fund observatory. How is how is VLATS funded? Is it? Funded. I don't just, they, I mean, it's using observatory time. Yeah, there's no funding. Who, who pays the people? It, it's just it's us. It's, it's we. It's, 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 it's we. It's, 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 it's all. Do the you believe there's a separate grant? No, there's not a grant. For, no, we just did it. Right. But so you use like so. So some FTEs have been have been dedicated to that, right? Yes. Sure. So we can decide to do that. Right. Well, just assign our staff, you thou shalt do, you know, a K band. Well, what, if you, what, if, what if you paired with, uh, couldn't you get like, because West Virginia is an EPSCOR state, couldn't you get some EPSCOR money from like WVU or someone else to say, hey, we want to do a large initiative with like Marshall University or WVU and say, you know, get some students involved and maybe a higher postdoc to go work with some of those folks to say, we could. That may be a way to do it that way. Yeah, you know, these these large surveys they they sound they they, they are um, manpower intensive, but not super manpower intensive, right? 
So we, we, could, we could grant essentially a single graduate student a couple of volunteers. So it was, you know, of course, we don't have any papers, so there's no there, there's part of that. <laughs> That's the other thing. But you know, it, it could be done without without a huge a huge investment. But then the question is, is the science case compelling? Well, if you if you offer it to be PI led, so you have some competitive process where you call for PI proposals and then say we will work with you to get some some sort of FTE support for the data processing to get it out there, right? And then observatory support for conducting the observations and disseminating the results, right? That yeah. might be a winning formula that doesn't stress anybody too much. So you know, we have an open uh, strategy program now where we do offer large programs and we do a lot of takers. And that's big, probably because of the, the difficulty in executing this, right? So if you want to move the catch, you move the catch. So you offer some funding. Cats will follow. So, the problem I have with this is the um, amount of time per square degree you need to do the survey. You know, it's 4,000 spectra per square degree. Okay, man. Okay. We spend a second per spectra. Yes, that's what we did. Two seconds. All right, so it's an hour per square degree. All right. All right. Yeah. So, with the, we did, well, more than. So we did about 20, so I'll, I'll take that. Um, we did our two second dump, but we were then oversampling the time back to three as we moved along. And then, we, of course, you'd have to move your array. Um, we covered our something like 20 square degrees in about four missions. So, so yeah, it would be several hundred hours of estimation and high frequency. Right, right. You have competitors for the high frequency time. Well, the chemistry yeah. folks won't get any QBAT time for this. <laughs> <laughs> Our strategy on KBAT, if we could take a look at that. I, I imagine we could do KBAT more often than we do. Because, you know, the competitor is Argus now. But we could, we could do a little bit. Whether that's worse than Argus. Certainly worse than CO. Well, we could definitely do it on the which is probably the only interaction there are is when you pass the exam. Is it compelling enough? And the, you know, if we're talking about then the next instrument that I guess is tomorrow's talk, or tomorrow's discussion. Uh, is the is is more ammonia with a worth a two million dollar investment or a five million dollar investment? Do a slide simultaneously and show water based experiments. But other things can be to do survey at the same time. Yeah, you know, the water, water mazes are, you know, we've all, all the money surveys have a water maser survey that they just have to look at. They haven't really looked at much, so we have it. VLAS was designed as a, in a response to transient satellites. Okay. I mean, that's why you have the three outbox, not just just one, right? So if this is hot right now for transients, what are we doing in that in that in that arena? Taking the K band hat off here. So yeah. I haven't seen a much of a compelling argument for. Green Bank can do, GBT can do for transient science. Uh, you know, maybe it's worth going after some interesting trigger that you know, Ruben is going to apply. I'm just thinking of synergies you now to get people excited. Matt, you know, you know, I, when we surveyed compelling to Rachel Friesen, who's probably on the right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and a bunch of collaborators in that sense. Um, but if, the, if we're moving for like Ruben, we're moving for these large surveys. What, do, what does what does GPT roll in that large survey now? Get the get the excitement, so get the good. science. The LIGO stuff was all about look, <coughs> so that that wasn't a new thing. That's no, right. That's an right. Now, if it's if you know where the source has gone off, and it's interesting to get a radio flux of that event, or you know, whatever mm -hmm. you want, then yeah, that's something we could do. We would have to. Um, 
come up with a system where we interrupt observation. Sure. Yeah. Slew away. So that's I don't know of any great compelling science argument where that that flux measurement and radio would be interesting, but that doesn't mean it, it isn't. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, one thing that you know the variability and monitoring that's really good solid bread and butter science we don't do a lot of that that's hard to get your tasks yeah i know so probably I've, a test right? I've, I've tried multiple times to try mm -hmm. to get something to the tech about variability yeah. and monitoring and just it's good. really hard the water mazers are wonderfully variable when they come and go and i don't i don't know we've learned a lot from variability maybe because we don't have enough we mostly look for variability just as a as a practical tool that if we get a maser spot that's bright enough, we can then jump on it with VLDI and phase reference to the to the maser self calc, which is a much more sensitive VLDI observation. We haven't really we haven't really done a lot in terms of understanding the physics of the variability. Now, um, Todd Hunter and crew are triggering on uh, methanol maser flares for creation. Yeah. So that's really good stuff. That's something I suppose we could do. Getting that regular cadence that you need, and you know, you need 50 to 100 sources to make it interesting. So that's doable. That's, it would be an investment, which I'll say. It's not cable. Ellie? using Mothra, but but yeah i mean the 140 foot would be great it could be automated even right to just point every day at the same subset of sources there's a yeah getting off k-band there's a group project where you could look at oh um, ir stars and by monitoring them you actually see a difference in when the blue shifted and the red shifted horn of that profile is flaring. Well, they were actually flaring at exactly the same time, but the time delay between them is the like travel time between the front and back of the shell. Cool. And you can get the physical size. Yeah. And you can go to the LPA and measure the actual angular size and you get the distances to those things. Yeah, that's, sure. That's a, that's a neat product. Yeah. We've tried something similar with the maser disks where if there's an accretion event at the black hole, yeah. You would expect the the energy to propagate out through the disk, and you should be able to see excitation um, as as the energy propagates out. We haven't been able to detect that signal yet, but, but that's a cool project too. Yeah, you probably want something that's radiated much. You can see that. Yeah. But you know, galactic plane surveys are really great. I really love them. <laughs> and, and you know, there's more there's more work to do. The question is, you know. What's what's the use then of? Is it to build up your statistics? Is it as a finding chart? One of the things I do worry about in the interferometer world is what do you let you are we always looking at the same sources that we yeah. 15, 20 years ago? Where are the new sources going to come from? And surveys could help with that. We're also kind of we have this scale mismatch, right? We're looking at really tiny things. 
that intermediate triangular scale is just kind of lost. And you know, there's physics on those scales that's not widely worked on just because there's this lack of data or interest. It sounds to me like there are these competing needs and they're both strong arguments for the for the uh, you know a large focal plane array and the two sensitive pixels and uh, is there any reason that they can't coexist? I mean, can we have them both at the same time? Is it just? Uh... Well, Steve, you can tell me that. So, uh, yeah. So, I was thinking about that. I mean, so we we could probably combine, say, K A and K band if you're only using two pixels in one receiver, and make you know get the whole bandwidth. Maybe even sample at the receiver because you know, talking about a couple of pixels that would solve your baseline problem or help. And so if, if we were redoing this, I mean, we, it, it would be a different approach. In the focal plan, right? Because you, you, you sacrifice some things and try to coop any feeds in one doer. If you, you do that requirement, then you can go back and start thinking about how you make things a little bit cooler. How you can improve the baselines. And like I said, if you're talking about the two pixels, two feeds, you might be able to combine it with another receiver. So you do both. I mean, that's what I'm that's what I get out of this. You really the, the divergent needs for K band. So there's, you know, there's kind of your need, extragalactic need is smaller, compact receiver. Whereas the ammonia mapping is a large focal phase ray feed. And so they, they, there's no reason you can't have both. And the astrochemistry needs is bandwidth, bandwidth, bandwidth. Right, exactly. I mean, if you can give us 18 to 37 gigahertz all in one go. Well, that's a little. He <laughs> <laughs> said, "Cable, K A." Full bandwidth. I said, "Yes." Yeah. So that's, that's right. actually, so could you do? I mean, you you can have two receivers in one. Sure. Divide it into eighteen to twenty-six, and then yeah. yeah. So yeah, that, you would have that. Yeah, that would be great. And then you should have on the hundred forty gigahertz like, micro like system. Yeah, that's where you would uh, you have the screen right in front of mm -hmm. two feeds. You could have two receivers looking at the same spot in the sky simultaneously and then do you know, K and QK simultaneously or whatever. Yeah, that would be great. How lossy is that? Hmm? How much loss is there? Do you, do you reflect well? well it's, it's usually single polarization. Yeah. So, um, so you lose that. Um, and so the 140 volt one, which was a beautiful device, um, it went from Five gigahertz up to thirty gigahertz, and there was very little, very little loss. I mean, so for us, as long as the loss is less than the factor of two that you get back from doing the simultaneous observations in time, then it's a win, right? Those were best when you have a, you know, integer ratio between the frequencies. Can you go to thirty gigahertz with the one forty foot? Mm -hmm. Can you go to 30 gigahertz with 140? I get it all the time. Yeah. 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 The issue is can we go to 30 gigahertz with the current state of the technology? Well, that's kind of what it all is. No, we've lost all the technology. We just have a deformable sub reflector and a uh, coma reducing lateral focus mechanism that all relied on hydraulics. And those things are in total disrepair. So that all would have to be re re resurrected. Doing your maser study, do you care about polarization? Um, only to the extent that uh, A, we want to combine and get Stokes I to improve our signal to noise, and B, we want circular to do the LDI. Uh, that's, that's it. But the, the signals are uh, not polarized. I mean, there's no Zeman splitting or anything like that. But, yeah, so no, we don't really care. Um, just moving on. Uh, should we be looking at combining more with the VLA or other instruments? 
I mean, I know it's, uh, you know, as someone pointed out yesterday, the VLA is not necessarily great for wide field mapping, but certainly very effective for smaller regions. Are there other instruments we could be combining that okay then? And should we be doing? What, is there a good science case for it? <coughs> Okay, go ahead, please. So there is one uh, but no like for the future of KVN such why uh, but really uh, our group is doing is like mapping the uh, benzoyl nitrile toward TMC1. We have tried with VLA and is the distribution is quite steady and diffuse. So most of the uh, distribution uh, emission are being swapped out. So we really want if there is uh, the possibility that we can combine both GBT and VLA and can map those, like for particularly a benzoyl nitrile and K band, that would be a fantastic project because benzoyl nitrile, as Graham mentioned earlier yesterday, that the emission peak is happen for in the K band family. So that's the that's the band that we are going to use, and the only band that we can use to map those like complex aromatic. Someone, I mean, uh, so the combination of GBT and VLA, it's it is one of the most exciting parts that we have as looking forward for for gas, for example. We have already several data sets that are being combined. Many of the papers uh, have produced really amazing data, and more importantly, many of those data sets uh, that are combined with the GBT. Now they are also being um, uh, compared to Argus GBT data, so it's not just the combination for the just for going for high resolution, but also that gives um, actually a, a very good reason why to observe with Argus because then the difference in beam size is, is not that bad, and you can actually smooth. Uh, your GBT plus VLA data to do very nice comparisons between those two data sets. Um, so I think that's a win-win a -win situation for, for you guys. Uh, but most importantly, I would say that the spectral resolution needs to be good enough to actually resolve most of the structures. So a few kilohertz resolution, it's what we're looking at. Um, so not tens. Not, I think more people are doing this than <coughs> used to, but it's still low numbers. So having done it, can you tell us why? Uh, or, the the spectral resolution or the, com the combination or the spectral resolution? The combination. <coughs> so the, the combination, basically, uh, I've experimented with uh, different techniques between uh, Spreading images or doing combination with uh, TP2Bs, which is uh, take the GBT data and generate pseudo visibilities. And the other approach is to use the GBT data as a model image, as, as a model image for the imaging. So, in, in my experience, the best solution is to take the GBT data and use it as a model image. And for that, uh, we need data that has very good signal to noise ratio because then basically that that solution implies that everything that you're looking with the GBT is real uh, so that you're not really introducing noise or or fake structures and if the noise of the G, of the VLA is much much higher than the that the GBT then that's not an issue at all then you are always going to to inject more noise from the VLA that is going to absolutely make your GBT noise in a way uh, invisible. So there is no, no problem with that. Um, but it is, it is a clear advantage on starting and doing all the imaging with the GBT as the starting point for the modeling, for the imaging, that, that it really makes a big, big difference. In, in terms of stability of the convergency for the, for the clean. Plus ramps, keystone and gas have covered most of the interesting objects with the GBT already. So that data exists. You just go to the VLA observe and they can combine it. So that sense 
we do get only a few proposals a year that are asking for both telescopes at the same time, but it doesn't mean that that's the amount of data being be quite higher because these surveys have already been done. Okay, so Rachel, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I think there was a question about why haven't uh, more people done this combination? And it, it really comes down to the um, the time it takes to get the VLA data to high enough sensitivity. Um, it's, you're still limited to fairly small regions, at least in terms of what I've been able to get through the tech. Um, and so, you know, we talked a while ago about you know, these X class surveys and whether or not some VLA uh, group gold belt survey would be something um, that we could look into. And um, that, that hasn't panned out yet, but I think, you know, with thinking headed to the uh, ANG VLA, maybe that's uh, a, a place where we could use the current surveys and perhaps some future surveys as, you know, these really amazing finding charts for a future larger VLA survey as well. And I also want to echo Jaime's point about the really nice synergy between GPT plus VLA and the, the three millimeter observing. Um, you know, we're using that for, for DISCO and there's gonna be some really nice comparisons, um, you know, in nearby clouds between, you know, N28 plus and other, you can you can view other species as well. So um, I really, you know, like that, that synergy between the two. All right, so one thing that I thought of was, um, can we increase the amount of time we spend observing a K band? You know, if we're trying to chase the galactic center sometimes and it doesn't always get too high. What can we do? <laughs> Any thoughts? I mean, we already kind of went over this a little bit. Well, is the ammonia mapping done in the best weather? It seems like with two. These, these tiny integrations, you don't really depend sensitively on the weather. Usually in the good, good weather, right, Tony? It depends on what the tax says. We can, you know, it's high enough rank, they do get the good weather or the excellent weather. If it's not as high or out of excellent weather time, we'll move it to good weather. Give it more time because we probably have a little bit higher system temperature. I think the answer to your question is what conditions are you willing to accept? Right? I mean, what increase in system temperature are you? Is it, um, um, for example, right, system temperatures double, it means that jurors would require four times more integration time to get to the same signal noise. Right? So, is, um, is that, is it, so doubling may not be such a productive use of the of time, but is it sort of two? Higher system temperature where you do the cutoff. Um, that's the sort of question I think that you should ask. Now, when you when you propose, you should be able, be able to specify. I'm willing to take a square root to higher system temperature than um, than the best available. For galactic center clouds in particular, for this particular, there those clouds are really bright. They're bright and they're fat lines, and so you, you, you're willing to. Smooth your data and velocity. You don't need the very best weather for that, right? Because most time, many times you're you know your overhead is going to be larger than that. Unfortunately, it's going to be about you know twenty degrees, so yeah. <laughs> we're living it that way. But no, you. This project I think is doable, and we if we relax our standards. Oh. Brent, you were the last person to be moved down to get weather. How'd that work out for you? It's, it's been fine. I I mean. Ultimately, at the end of the day, since it's the, the, the biggest objection that I would have back in the day would have been, I just don't want to physically do that many more hours of observations. But since they're operator driven, uh, it, it hasn't really affected us, right? We get, as, as long as we achieve the same RMS in the end, it doesn't really matter how we get there. Um, and we've more or less gotten the RMS that we want um, out of that. I was just about to ask whether or not, right? There's often, uh, if you look at the GPT schedule, a lot of RFI scans in there, right? Um, and, you know, 
is it possible to propose a project category that's a filler that's operator driven that we say yeah we'll accept basically any weather condition just just give us those hours that aren't going to be used for anything else no, 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 no. I, basically any not not monsoons tell me not, not 40 mile an hour winds right but even even maybe a little lower quality than good right something that's currently just you know 20 percent below the threshold for k-band just say look if we get a hundred one hour slots over the course of the semester that otherwise would have been used for for something else then that is rms right that's that's added into it maybe not for our really really high sensitivity stuff um but for, for other spectral line projects that could add up um it might be a terrible idea but we're supposed to be increasing the amount of time we spend observing it so I think it, it might be good for like exploratory kind of exploratory stuff yeah sure yeah we're just trying to figure out what are the next targets we want to look at for example you know we don't want to propose for super long surveys of a bunch of targets but if we know it's going to be filler and it's just going to add to be convincing like oh this is a source you want to target then we can kind of add that moment as rms rolls in especially if like jim said it's a bright line source or right. rather our exploratory observations are only interested in bright line sources if the question is is this source bright or not right um then it's almost a waste of good weather time to to look for a three kelvin line right um when yeah if the system temperature is five times higher even you could still see that within uh uh, a few minutes of integration, right? Um, get your yes or your no. And that could be done in very poor for K band weather, right? Um, so we have to propose you should actually just specify an RMS. And we figure out how well that's a that's a that's a that's a that's a it's a programmatic question, yes. So that's moving to the alma mode of operation, right? Um, which as its pros and cons, but, or maybe there is a proposal category that is fill, RMS filler time, right? So in this, this specific mode of operation, you are requesting very simple observations that are operator driven that can be done in half an hour or one hour chunks and are meant to get RMS on a selection of sources and you get what you get and, uh, and you have no control good. over it and that's that's just what comes out of the end. Yeah, you can't necessarily guarantee a good RA in depth, you know, it's just if it's up, pick what's closest. Yeah. yeah. So from my experience scheduling, what we ran up against in your project was the wind limits. Yeah, that would yeah. So if you have a more extended source, then yeah, we, we can go a bit more weather. But yeah. if you're a pretty narrow source, then what we did for your Gotham is probably that's about what we can do. do. Yep. Not working very hard. Oh. Situation is pretty similar for Mazer stuff. I think in Mazer surveys, we could expand the survey, and any spectrum with the GBT is valuable, even if it's even if it's moderate or even poor for K band weather, unless the wind is blowing, because then we're not confident in the data. Um, where you know the, the monitoring that we do really needs the best weather. The VLBI needs outstanding weather. But we could survey things and, you know, if we don't get to the RMS, we can just come back and do it again another time and add, you know, add to it. Um, the surveys could be done in mediocre, I would say. I don't know if this would scale with, down the KFDA, but what Mustang does is they use a quadrant detector to figure out how the feed arm shake and the wind and everything. They do flux corrections based on that. I don't know, something like that. They have other beams that we can map. Yeah. And when you're trying so to I don't know if you have to scale the KFDA or not. It's, so the wind is a loss of efficiency, right? Because you're not on the source all the time. So again, it's sort of, you know, <laughs> it's our it's 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 related to your RMS, right? Right. Well it's but also if you get longer the wind's blowing. The the danger is if you know if we were to let's say try to automate a program like like Brett was describing, including automating the pointing scans. If you get a bad pointing scan, then it's worse than just a Loss in efficiency, it's you know, you're not looking in the right spot. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's right, they're short us. Uh, if these are only half hour to an hour, you know, not a no a priori at the very beginning if you're actually going to run into major wind problems or something. They only need to be stable for a short period of time. Sometimes the wind can just die down for a little bit of a while where you're like, okay, it's not enough to run. For our program, we know we're just going to have to repoint a little bit, but maybe we got enough time, maybe a half hour 
or something like that to run a short little quick spurt. Maybe, I don't know how often those things come up, but yeah. You know. So it's very rare, actually, when uh, the winds are going to be high enough where your K band point is going to be during around atrocious. Yeah. yeah. You really have to be in, you know, in the, uh, the top 10% wind conditions. Yeah. Our pointing issues are rarely due to winds. I don't know what they're due to. <laughs> so this seems like a good opportunity for a test just to see what you guys We'll get a very large fan. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, a more passive test. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So um, this this is just something that I think has been presented to me this, but uh, I think it's been suggested to install, and I don't know how much this would help, but install an anemometer in the shield room. Um, deflection to do um, another suggestion I think is actually coming out by the water spoke at some point on the uh, feed arm um, to kind of reference all the points on the dish um, uh, to kind of monitor those um, deflections. But uh, yeah, I don't know how much of an impact, how much of an impact this is, uh, you know, leading to. Certainly, take a lot of guesswork out, you know, at least when we're trying to figure out planes initially. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose. Something like masers, or or where we're looking for particularly bright lines. If the if the readings were sufficiently fast, and the time series was reported such that you could line up particularly bad timing with the jitter with this this thirty second integration, and just pull that rather than ditching a ten minute period. I suppose you could, but I, I think that's going to bring. I don't know. I can't do that in GBT IDL. Some somebody might be able to. Um, the natural frequency of the telescope is 28 hertz. Okay. And the quick crossing time is well, it's a few seconds. Mm -hmm. And so we've actually did a test run. So Richard Prestes did this, uh, <coughs> um, taking the quadrant detector uh, measurements of how the feed arm moved and feed it back into the subreflector to actually move the subreflector in so as to keep the, the beam of the telescope yes. uh, on your source as the wind moves. But that we never closed the loop on that, but that is technically possibly possible. Yeah. In which case we can then observe it in winds that we just can't even have. Wind speeds, yeah. Kind of adaptive optics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you combine the two approaches so that you, uh, you know, that takes care of the short of the, the, the midterm variations, right? And then if you get a really strong gust that you can account for, but you know that it happened and you can you know, blank out that chunk in your data. So the idea yeah. was also to measure it and then blank your data. Yeah, yeah exactly. So that was, that, was, that was option one, and then option two was they actually serve the server. The bandwidth, the server <laughs> bandwidth is there to do this. Cool. I would just think that the scale of layers up with. We have to do some yeah, layers. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a number, just the scaling back of how much of the server effect you know, moves to several right? Mm -hmm. So it's just one number. This is all in the budget, right, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of in terms of uh, science areas, are we already focusing on the right science areas? Is there anything someone somewhere is thinking? Why aren't they doing this? Right then. The things I thought of, like the galactic center, someone, I think Eric yesterday yeah. mentioned the pulsars towards the galactic center and scintillation. We don't have a lot of continuum, we don't do a lot of polarization. We'll say there has been a search for pulsars that came in to the galactic center. Hmm. And I don't think that panned out at all. I guess a lot of KU, they did some at KU as yeah, well. Yeah, they, they bounced around the frequencies, what's going to be optimal. They tried K band, they tried KU, they tried X. Still haven't found us a thing. Do they see the magnetar or no? We can get the magnetars, yes. And the one or two bright pulsars that are known, but that supposed population that's there at low um, intensities, no one's gotten to it. With regard to continuum, I would just move up to KA band with the CCB. That is so far superior than anything we can do with a traditional receiver. 
and I don't think there's much of a difference in the science what you do with K-band versus K-A with regard to continuum. Not unless you want to try and do something like combining it with BLA K-band numbers. Yeah. Is the CCD still in the telescope? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we don't have anybody here that can help support you, but we get struggling. <laughs> we used to use it for pointing, I remember. Yeah, right. we use it for the OOF. Oh, but yeah, you I think the only K-band continuum I can think of that we haven't covered is some people wanting to do axion sections. And if you actually look at the literature, everybody's favorite model either covers from zero to infinite wavelength <laughs> on what the where the axion should show up in. It's mostly spinning dust and things like that. So if you look at the Sagittarius B2N or those G uh, files, they keep files in the galactic center over chemistry. There's, I know other groups are doing it, but not at Hayden. So Tony yeah. is giving you a face <laughs> oh, right now. Sorry. Uh, <coughs> Stepping on time. Uh, because uh, Tony was one of the first, chem the only chemistry large program until Gotham, well, Primos, which was a, a survey yeah. of, of SAG B2N at K-Band uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and all other frequencies. Um, but he, Tony, but do you have more to say? More of it, I guess. Like, it does need to it, get redone. Like I'm saying, like there's, I don't see any current proposals for it. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, has there been follow-up, like mapping yeah. or? I keep trying. They keep rejecting my proposals. <laughs> that would be an interesting. <laughs> that would be an interesting. I mean, like, I mean, I mean, no joke. Mapping yeah. and also chemistry. Like, I don't know. Like, could we map some of these bright um, objects that CCS or I don't know something? Yeah. So, so Tony, did, did we end up putting in the mapping, the KFPM mapping for? It, it went into like the fifth time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, I asked, yeah, this is, it keeps going through and it's not raised up. But so we, you know, this is 15 years ago. We, do, we use K-band and we detect a lot of these lines of absorption and we try to follow them with the BLA. They're completely well dissolved out with BLA. We have no idea where the absorption features are coming from necessarily. And so we've been trying to get Yes, and then KFPA, like great, we could just do some mapping yeah. two arc minute by two arc minutes, something like that, and just get a you know, just find out where all the absorption is coming from. Just, just, mm -hmm. So, Sam, please join the tag. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, one we also one have one, the, of the, one of the oh. things that parts the black center is everybody at all frequencies wants to observe, sure, they are black, so that makes it really highly oversubscribed. Probably a factor of three or four more competitive for the time. But I mean, these so are, if, if you can find something equivalent to do in the outer galaxy, you know, Orion, Taurus, stuff. It's, we, yeah, uh, it's a, several you factors. Can't, you, can't, you can't do, do it there. Right, there. you have to do that low frequency, right? But yeah, I mean, these, are, these would be bright lines, though, that could be in this category of kind of RMS, like we were talking about before. Yeah. So some of, these, some of these lines, you know, uh, form of my lines, yeah, right? Yeah. It's two minutes. Yeah. Two minute integration, and it's clearly detected. It's yeah. 50 Melodjanskis or something like that. So it's yeah. it's easy. Yeah. I, 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 you're preaching to the choir. I know. You, know, I, you, I, don't, I, you don't have to convince me. If I was on the tag, I would give you time. I can't, <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't get them through. So I had a monitoring project. We have a, we have a possible maser at S band or something, or bigger C band, or get C band. Oh, really? Right. We tried. We tried. Tried with the BLA. <laughs> we tried. But, well, yeah, and it came out. Tried yeah. monitoring with with a monitoring observation okay. because I don't know if it's time variable right. or not. Yeah. We didn't see the BLA. We tried to go back and observe. It just I cannot get a look at time. Okay. There's just they just don't rise up to. It's it's this is weird chemistry stuff. All right. Fine. Mapping Ryan's interesting. So I mean, and, yeah, and, and Jim knows. Yeah. I got I got pretty I got pretty tired of getting rejected, so I just hung it up for like four or five years. I'm just I'm done. I just we tried multiple times to get things through. I didn't get it through, and oh well. I just but I tried it again this time, so we'll see what happens. I mean, almost worse. I'm I'm over ten. Yeah. So it is what it is. So what about mapping other models? 
like C like C three H two. Yeah. Is there any, is yeah. any science in that? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, Ron, yeah. is because that's been rough. You know, that was thirty odd years ago. And that was cyclic C three H two is ridiculously strong. It came out and has and all kinds of spiral arc clause between here and the galactic center. You can see it. Um, it it, it's a tremendous project to start investigating this, but the what we found, even with primals, is you didn't know what to, you were going to find until we started taking the data. I don't know a really strong, good science case for mapping the distribution of cyclic C3H2 right now. It'll be the results. We can guarantee the results, the results will be results interesting. interesting. Yeah. They will produce many papers. Right? I mean, one of, one of the very early things we did in, in primals with Dana was we found that the void line profiles for the hydrogen recombination line. So just randomly came out. That was not anything that we were trying to do, you know, but it's like, you know, Dana looked at these lines like, wow, those are, and I had Rick Fisher, he's doing the, he did the line fitting. We, it's nice paper, but it had nothing to do with what we were doing with primals. We've got tons of recombination lines and we did a, by the electron temperatures and all that kind of stuff. So you don't know what you're going to get with these surveys until you get them. It's the same thing with the ammonia surveys, right? That's that's why you might want to map the entire sky, right? The places that, that aren't bright and well known. It's, you know, <laughs> what you're the entire sky, at least the galactic plane. Oh, shit. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, sorry. <laughs> sorry. We want the galactic plane. I'm sorry. The only good part. I'll scale with that. You want to text four or five stereos. <laughs> yeah, Jay's not in the room. It's okay. We can, we can <laughs> limit ourselves. It never gets enough. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Is there a benefit to doing polarization of data? Who wants to do that? Anyone? No. Once. Twice. <laughs> oh, right. Really? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Don't know if any of them have been accepted or panned out. There's uh, polarization of flat spectrum continuous for season. I don't know. That's a BLA project. Yeah. Not a BLA type object, the polarization changes over nightly time scales. So there, there's going to be stuff there. I don't know what you gave. KPN is a whole other program. It's stronger. We have detected it in. In very narrow flaring maser lines, extragalactic, and we put it up in the middle. And I know it's, it's, it's barely detectable, and it only happened once or maybe twice that a line was narrow enough to try it. So it, it hasn't really been a science driver. Galactic maser, they would be right about that. Galactic masers would be a different story. <laughs> She's got beautiful maps of galactic yeah. but, but it's not like those transitional maze of water. It's more like where species like methamine and those new kind of so, type of right, what I was, Sam, what I was, when we do these low frequency stuff, you got to watch out for some of these lines because they could be masers. You don't even know about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Methylamine, methylamine, methylformate, uh, carbodiamide, these glycolaldehyde. They're all amazing down at these low frequencies. All of them. Cool. In what object? Well, I mean, Sanskrit too. Yeah. But it could be that. I don't any, know any, why. Any, 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 source with, any source with some of these, you know, with large EV or, or, you know, with a, with a rated background could, could have the exact same thing. I mean, these are all major sources down there. HC3M was a, the one to zero transition, HC3M, the Galactic Center was a major source, and that was seen back in the 90s. Could not explain why it was so bright. So there's a lot of interesting physics down there if you can understand why these why these low energy transitions are amazing down there. Okay. Yes, but people understand the water maser. People understand the methanol maser. I have a carbodiamide maser that may be time variable. They're like, what is a carbodiamide and why do I care? Which is this water maser? I could I can measure H naught. I say it's a carbon dioxide maser. I can measure Why? Some, so, something. I don't know what, but maybe something. Are your molecules polar enough to measure sigma zeta? 
No. Nope. CN, but that's not, yeah, but you have to go to uh, the Probably bad. Why not prompts? <laughs> a lot of gas. <laughs> yeah, um, we're heading towards dinner time. Has anyone uh, else got an, a topic for discussion? If anyone wants a Cape Answer at Classic Center, please come see me. We got, we got that. I do. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> I'll send you the data when I get up back to my yes, yes, You can have it. Yeah, right there. Is that the nominator for the SRP? Yeah, get her on the back. You can self nominate. Perfect. <laughs> Stack the deck. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> it's always making these people off. <laughs> 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 just one maybe some question. Do we accept joining the council if we are a and we need to take them particularly now? Or is it clear to them? If not, if we're going to come direction, maybe we can be aware of it. Like when we submit a proposal, we submit like the same proposal. The scientists can is the same mm -hmm. to both GBT and ELA because mm -hmm. they are using the exact same frequency setup, but different facility. Of course, the scientist classification committee is a different a different facility. But would that be something that you may consider about? That? I think you can just take it through it. It's just a button. It's a radio button. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Joint with BLA, it's, it's yeah. there. You have to make two proposals with no. one science yeah. case and submit it to the BLA. No, 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 this is this. I mean, so basically for HST, we just say, tell me how many hours you need. But for joint BLA GBT, you have to submit two freaking proposals with two resources. Yeah, you have to say, try to the list of this. The TTA is fixing it. The TTA is normally fixing it. Oh, great. The last decade. Like, you get the questions. I think it's a bit of a set of this proposal and this proposal. Shoot the messenger. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tony's now upset. Great. Well, we've angered Tony, which mission accomplished. So, <laughs> any other final questions? It's, it's, it's not hard. <laughs> Planetary Okay. Anything there? I mean, I Anybody in here do exoplanet atmospheres? Exoplanet? You can't do exoplanet. No. Planetary. Sorry, I couldn't hear of it. Planetary atmospheres. We we observed Venus back in February. Tell me what you're talking about. No, we were looking for a minute. <laughs> 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 I'm amazed no one with GBT has ever done CO on Mars. It's a, it's a 10 second observation. We do it on the ARO all the time for our uh, summer program. Yeah. If Venus was hard, it was much harder than I was expecting. That was the problem. Yeah, the light was huge. But it was just so bright. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to calibrate. Has anybody pointed at Titan? We yeah. have, but it was sort of a lander. Okay, <laughs> just for okay. <laughs> <laughs> one of the what's the what's the satellite of Saturn that has all Triton plumes? Triton. Europa. No. Europa has plumes. Enceladus. 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 The beam dilution is going to be a color. It's too low. Uh, maybe. Oh, from the water should, from the maser. You should be able to do SO and SO2 on IO. You should be able to do SO and SO2 on IO. But the question is 
can you actually point to Io without getting Jupiter in the feed? Yeah, we're still going to come from Io anyway. I mean, people create a calibration. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's too close. Jupiter's a thermal object at the cave end, right? So it's just the it won't be your system by tens right. of yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. No, it, uh, not in that case. I'll ask, I'll ask the planetary group that I know. We'll see what they, like for Enceladus or Triton or Titan or any of those things, the hydrocarbon. You probably Titan, talk about you those. might expect some of these XC blank M. Yes. Titan. Yes. Vinyl cyanide. Yep. You could do vinyl cyanide. Vinyl cyanide. You could do vinyl cyanide at ethyl cyanide. Okay. <laughs> Adam. I mean, benzonitrile will show up down there as well. Yeah. yeah. Hydrogen, which we, it's below the detection limit for Alma, unfortunately. So I don't know how it would work out. With I would do the higher frequency to get the smaller beam. Yeah. Yeah. On GB. You could do double even. You could do like seven. That's a false seed line. You might want to do an absorption experiment as the satellite passes in front of Jupiter. Sure. Because then you got yeah. some extra oh, oof out of it. That's interesting. How about comets? Jupiter's mostly home distance. And then the other part. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> comets, Tony? No, please call this session. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the panel. <laughs> and uh, we'll be back here tomorrow morning at uh, 9 o'clock. Sometimes you just need a new team.